Well, good morning. Good, good. I'm so glad that you're here. Found a way to, you know, spring forward. It's always an important time of the year, you know. My favorite time of the year is to spring forward. You know, we don't like it, but it's always a good sign, right? I mean, there's better weather coming along. I mean, it's not a bad thing, right? You guys don't seem like it's a really good thing. I mean, you guys are like, this is the worst thing ever, Pastor, you know. Hey, uh, listen, I, I appreciate you guys being here. I really, I do. I, uh, I'm really just thankful for you guys. I'm thankful for your faithfulness, and I'm, I'm thankful that you are a church that is giving and uh, kind. And I mean, each and every week, you guys are just so gracious with your tithes and your offerings. And uh, I just want to say thank you for that, you know. And, uh, you know, I just, I'm just amazed at your generosity as a church. And it allows us to do things in this community. It allows us to update things in our building. It allows us to hire new staff and things of that nature. So thank you for that. And uh, I just appreciate your generosity and your faithfulness and your willingness to serve and, and uh and love this community. Today we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you have your Bible, would you turn there with me? Uh, continuing down this road uh, in 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 12. It reads, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. For he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body or do you not know that your body is a temple or as a temple of the holy spirit within you whom you have from god you are not your own but you were bought with a price so glorify god with your body let's pray father we give you thanks for the day we thank you so much for the many blessings that you've given to us we thank you for your love and kindness and, and generosity father i uh, am just Again, I'm just so thankful for this church, so thankful for their commitment to you, their commitment to reaching this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you for uh, all that's going on here at Wyatt Park and all that you're doing here. Father, we know that uh, you are active, you are moving, you are speaking to us, and now as we come together as a body of believers and we gather around your word, Father, I pray that you would just incline our hearts to hear from you about what you're doing, how you're moving, how you're speaking to the people of God, and how you are speaking to us. Father, allow for us to hear a message from you today. I recognize, Lord, that I have a part in that, so if you would forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of the unrighteousness that is in my life and give me the grace that is needed to preach your word in a way that brings honor and glory to your name, in a way that brings sinners to repentance and believers to a time of renewal in their relationship with you. I, I thank you, Lord, just for the many different elements of worship that we've experienced here today. I thank you especially for the baptisms that we've seen. And I pray, Lord, that there's someone here today that has never accepted Jesus Christ, that has never professed Jesus as Savior and Lord and walked into those baptismal waters that today would be that day where they say, I need that Jesus. I need that forgiveness of sin. I want to experience what it means and how it feels to have your sins washed away. So, Father, we just pray that you would speak to the people here today that have never experienced your grace and mercy, that they would experience that today in fullness and in truth. 
for the believer that's here that's maybe struggling or going through difficult times in their relationship with you and maybe there's somebody at home that's watching from their couch or their bed maybe that just is struggling with their faith and not sure how they're going to walk through these doors but they feel comfortable walking into their living room and turning on the TV or watching from a cell phone or an iPad. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would just allow for them to know that this is a safe place to come. That they are welcomed here. This is a community of believers that not only loves you, but loves others, that serves the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that today your gospel will be proclaimed through your word. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Did you know that the president of the United States cannot drive his own car? I mean, I think that's just wrong. If I... I don't think I could ever be the president because of this. You know what I mean? Like, what am I going to do with all the trucks that I buy? You know what I mean? Like, I, if I can't drive them, I'm the best driver in this room, by the way. You know, like, I, <laughs> like, I don't trust anybody else. I don't like, when I'm riding with you and I'm in the passenger, I don't feel comfortable doing it. You know, I don't even, like, I love my wife, but when she's driving, it makes me nervous, you know, and not because she's a bad driver, but because I'm not driving. You know, I think I should be in control, you know. And if I'm the most powerful man in the world, can I drive my own? I mean, come on. But they say it's for safety, right? Tell that to John F. Kennedy. You know what I mean? Like tell, I mean, just think about, I mean, was it safe for him? I don't think it was. You know, if he was driving, maybe that would have been a different situation. You know, maybe he could have seen. I, I think about these things, you know. Very, just because you can do something, though, doesn't mean that you should, you know? As a pastor, there are a lot of things that I'm morally and legally allowed to do, but I shouldn't do them because of my faith and because of my calling. Pastors are called to live above reproach. They are called to a higher standard. In a similar breath, though, there are just some things that you won't have a problem with me doing, you know? But I will. Like, I, I have personal convictions that are different than your convictions for me and what you think a pastor should and shouldn't do. And so because of my convictions, I won't do some of the things that you think it's okay for me to do. And the vice versa, right? My convictions don't always line up with yours and yours don't always line up with mine. And that's okay. It is. It's all right for us. I mean, if... If I force my convictions upon you, that would be legalism. That's what legalism is. It's saying, hey, just because I believe something to be true, that means that you have to believe it to be true. But if, if none of us have convictions, then that's not the answer either, is it? Right? I mean, if none of us just had any type of spiritual convictions from the Lord, is that the answer? Absolutely not. What Paul is saying in today's passage of Scripture is just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Let's look at verses 12 and 13. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for the food, and God will destroy both one and another. Paul is most likely quoting here from the Corinthian culture. They had found a way to kind of take this common day saying and put it into their spiritual practice. That's most likely what's happening. The first saying is, all things are lawful for me. What they're saying isn't false. We have freedom in Christ, amen? But we're no longer bound to the Old Testament law, but just because you're free doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want. Men, if your wife says that you can go out with the boys, does that mean that you can go wherever you want? You can do whatever you want? You can talk to whoever you want to talk to? Ladies, if your husband says, 
You can go shopping. Does that mean that you can buy whatever it is that you want? You can go to whatever store and swipe that credit card as many times as you want to? Well, the second saying is food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food. Today we would say we live to eat, not eat to live. Diet, mat diet matters, doesn't it? I mean, it's important. It's a hard subject to talk about. But friends, one of my favorite restaurants is a place called Fogo de Chao. I've talked about this before, but it's like, it's a great place, Brazilian steakhouse. You can go and it's like, they have 12 different types of meat on a stick. And they just bring it out to you and they just shave it off. And you can eat as much as you want. There's a salad bar there and weirdos, they go and they eat salad when they're there. You know, like, why would I ruin my appetite on rabbit food? You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't understand that. But I like going there. I mean, I really do. It's, it's glorious, you know. But I eat too much when I go. I just, I mean, I do. I, I cannot control myself. I don't have any self-control. When I walk through that door, I'm just like, I'm going to make some poor decisions today. You know, like I just think, and, and you know what, if I was there every day, it would be a really bad decision, right? Once in a while, it's not the worst, but that's just a, I mean, you can't eat a box of Oreos every night before you go to bed, right? I mean, it's just, it's not good for you. I like Oreos, but I know I cannot do that. Okay, I love bluebell ice cream, but I cannot eat butter pecan every night before I go to bed. There are some things, I mean, like, hey, though it may be acceptable to have a, a bad diet every once in a while, you shouldn't make poor choices every day. And there's going to be a point in your life where you just got to say, hey, you know what? I can't do that anymore. I can't eat. Like as a young kid, you can eat pretty much whatever you want. I remember when I played sports in high school, I mean, we would have two-day practices and we would go to like Pizza Hut and we would eat as much food from the Pizza Hut buffet and I wouldn't gain any weight at all because the next like three hours I'd be running in the August sun, right? And it wouldn't affect you. And like, and then your metabolism, and like you're just... Now you look at something and you gain weight. You know what I mean? Like it's just, and there, your body reacts to food in such a way where, like, hey, I can't, I can't drink soda like that anymore. I can't go to the movies and eat popcorn. It's, I mean, it just affects you. <sighs> Some of your old age is wearing off, you know, and so it may be acceptable. Paul's using these sayings to illustrate a larger, more important issue that was going on in the church in Corinth. And that, one, and that is the issue of sexual immorality. He's using these very common, just because you can, doesn't mean that you should. Things like food, things like just common day occurrences. Verse 13, B. The body is not meant for sexual morality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body, verse 14 says that God raised the Lord and will also raise, up, raise us up by his power. Friends, what you do with your physical body matters. Uh, you should take care of it. You should eat right. You should exercise. You should listen to your body. You should go and you should find a good doctor. This, this body that you have, it's the only one that you got, right? I mean, we're not, we're not turning it in for another one on this earth. I mean, it's the only one you got, friends. You need to take care of it. But Paul says that we should also honor, the God, honor God with our body. And one of the ways that we can do that is to flee from sexual immorality. We talked about this two weeks ago, but just a reminder here, okay, in case you weren't here, in case, you know, you forgot something that I preached from weeks ago. But sexual immorality in the New Testament, it, it's, it's a broad stroke here, okay? It's not just one thing. It's, 
It's all everything that falls under the umbrella of sexual morality. It's fornication. It's adultery. It's homosexuality. It's incest. It's bestiality. It's much more than a single sin. It is absolutely encompasses all sexual sin. There are times in our faith and in our walk where we want to make some sexual sins worse than others and we try to vilify this sexual sin or that sexual sin. But the reality is, according to God's word, it's all sin, friends. It's all under the facet of sexual immorality. There's not one that's worse than the other. It's all bad. It's all wrong. At this time, there were people who believed that the body was evil. Um, Corinthians tried to say that our souls and our body were two different things. They were not connected spiritually at all. And by saying this, by thinking this, they, uh, they kind of had a, a way out. They a- allowed them to commit sexual sins, commit sexual immoral- immorality, to have sexual immorality uh, acts in their life. And so... Paul says here (laughs) that the body is for the Lord. And if the body was so evil, if the body was not connected spiritually at all, if it has no connection to our soul, then why did Jesus give up his body for your sin? I mean, why did he hang on the cross? If the body has no connection to the spiritual, then why did God raise the body from the dead? Why is he going to raise our body from the dead? If there's no connection here between soul and body, if the body is evil, the soul is good, who cares about the body, do whatever you want. Why was God so concerned with our Savior's body? Why is God so concerned about our body at the end of the time? If you don't believe me, listen to what he says in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one, friend, one flesh. Friends, as the church, we are called to be the body of Christ. We are called the body of Christ. We, what we do with our bodies doesn't just affect us. It doesn't just affect our physical body, but it actually affects the, the body of Christ. For a, a Jewish boy, he became a man at the age of 13. For a Jewish girl, it was the age of 12. In this culture, in the Corinthian culture, it was actually a little bit older, okay? For a a non-Jew, they became a man probably around the age of 14, a boy somewhere between 14 and 17 years old. That's what history tells us. History also tells us that they would allow for their son to have a relationship with a prostitute when he became of age, okay? So the Corinthians, they would do that for for their child. They would do that to their child. And many of these Corinthians parents, the, the, the fathers, experienced that same thing when they were a young boy or a man, whatever you want to call it. Okay? Prior to their conversions, many of them visited a prostitute. Again, it's not illegal, a part of their norm. Again, what Paul is saying here, just because you can doesn't mean that you should. Paul is fighting a battle here that's just, it's not just spiritual battle, friends. It's a culture as well. It's culture. Does it make sense? He's saying here, hey, just because you, this was a norm in your society doesn't mean that it should be a norm in your faith. Like, as he talked about in the first half of this chapter, God saved you from that lifestyle. He brought you from it. Don't go back into it. He's trying to teach them 
that what you do with your body matters. It matters to God. It matters to your spiritual health. It matters to the, the spiritual health of the body of believers that you're a part of. When a church leader, for instance, is caught in sin, does it just affect him? I, I, can, I can tell you of pastors here who are part of a denomination who, who left the denomination because a leader in their denomination was caught in sexual sin. And it affected his church in such a way that they had to leave the denomination because of it. It affects something far greater than yourself, friends. He draws back to creation and he says that when two, are con when two join, they are connected. The two become one. There's something far greater here that happens than just the physical act. Sex is not a bad thing. God gave it to us for our own good. But as men tend to do, we take something that was created for good and beautiful things and we have turned them into something that is far from God honoring. Verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a, a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own. You are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. The Gospel of John, John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. We have, friends, such a deep connection with the Lord. It's far greater than I think we were able to comprehend that our bodies and our, our Lord are connected in ways that we just, I mean, we don't understand. <laughs> I just, uh, Going back to this conversation of convictions, when God convicts you of something, whether that's a, uh, something you're doing that you shouldn't be doing or something that you're thinking about doing that you shouldn't be doing, or maybe God is just saying, hey, this is, you see somebody else that's doing something and you think, I, I, God is telling you not to do something. Sometimes that's just what's going on up here, but sometimes that's what's going on with your body. And God leads you in ways that don't make sense to the people outside of the Christian community. And sometimes what God calls us to do and who he calls us to be, it makes no sense to the outside world, friends. Well, why can't you do this? Or why can't you go here? Why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? It doesn't matter. But in our hearts, we know that still small voice speaks to us in such a way that we know without a shadow of a doubt. Henry Blackaby tells a story of a guy that he knew, a businessman, a salesman, who was getting ready to go on a, a plane, a flight to do work. And he said, he goes, usually the man would wear a power suit for this trip, a trip like this. And he said he was, he was getting packed, he was getting dressed, and something told him to put on a, a tie that was just from his alma mater that had, I'm not sure what school it was, let's just say 
Kansas because that's a good school and it's local and everything. Everybody around here loves UK. And, uh, but he puts on this tie and he puts a power tie in his pocket and he goes on to the airport. He says he didn't think anything of it, but he just said he felt like that was what God wanted him to do was to wear this tie. He gets there and sits down and a guy sits next to him who was from that same university. And they got to the chatting, got to talking. And th this businessman was able to share his faith with this guy sitting next to him and he accepted the Lord. I mean, just think about, sometimes God calls us to do things and speaks to us in ways that uh, it doesn't make any sense to anybody else. But you know, without a shadow of a doubt, God is speaking to you. He's telling you, I want you to do this right here. I want you to go and go talk to your neighbor. I want you to go eat here. Now, not every day that happens. Not every day he tells you what tie to wear. Not every day he tells you where to go to eat. Not every day does he tell you, go talk to this person. But sometimes, friends, there are ways that the Lord will speak to you. And you know, without a shadow of a doubt, I'm supposed to do this. I'm supposed to go here. I'm supposed to go do this. God has ordained for me this opportunity to be his hands and his feet, to use this body for his honor, for his glory. And friends, let me just tell you from personal experience, but if you are caught in sin and you are living in sin and you're doing things with your body that you shouldn't be doing, you're going to suppress anything that the Lord says to you. Or you're just not going to be able to hear, or God won't even speak to you in those manners. And you're wasting your life. You're wasting the body, the life that God has given to you. What you do with your body, it matters. It matters. We have a deep connection to our Lord and Savior. What we do with our body matters to Jesus. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we are committing ourselves to him and him alone. We are inviting him into our lives. Paul says here that when we sin against the body, when we commit a sexual sin, it's unique because we sin not only against our Lord, but we sin against the body. And he says here that your body is a what? Temple. What's a temple? I mean, when you think about a temple, what is it? A place where you go and who? Do what? Meet God? I mean, God is there. Let me just say this. If, if you came into this room today and people were actively living in sin, would you want to be here? Would you be like, I, 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 this, is a, this is a place where I want to go and worship God? No. You would flee from this place. <laughs> Do you remember the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Joseph, in Genesis chapter 39, Joseph is in Egypt, and he is, uh, he's a slave, right? I mean, he is a slave. And he's serving Potiphar. And uh, it says that po Potiphar sees Joseph sees what he's doing and likes it. Likes his work, likes his character, likes the results, really, right? And so in verse 30, I'm sorry, not verse 30, in verse 8, so he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food that he ate. 
Potiphar was so impressed with Joseph's work that he said, I'm going to take everything that I have and I'm going to let you be responsible for it. It's pretty trusting, right? Has it, have you ever had somebody give you something and say, you're in charge of it? Here, jo- here Joseph is left in charge of everything that his master has. Everything. And what happens next? Right after this verse, we see that Potiphar's wife sees Joseph and likes what he sees, likes what she sees. And tries to entice him into her bed. Matter of fact, what it says is that she took his robe and he, she pulled it off and Joseph was what? Naked. And what does Joseph do? I mean, he has a choice right then and there, right? He's enticed to go into this bed of his master's wife. He could do that or he could do what he did. That's what, what we should all do when we are enticed with sexual sin. Flee. Run away. That's what he did. He absolutely 100% ran. He didn't care about the consequences of that decision. He ran. Friends, I firmly believe that we have been put in charge. We have responsibility, not just with our bodies, not just with our bodies, but we have a responsibility, friends, to the entire church. That God has left us in charge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That it's our responsibility to be the hands and the feet of our Lord and Savior. To be the body of Christ. And friends, when we sin against our own body, we sin against the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have a responsibility. We have been put in charge. We have this obligation from our Lord and Savior to be faithful. Douglas Wilson, he has a book out. It's called Her Hand in Marriage. It's it's really popular with young people today. It's about uh, biblical courtship in a modern world. Because that's what all the cool kids want to do is they want to court their wife. You know what I mean? But what he says in this book is that (laughs) romance is like curtains in a house, you know. We, uh, young people, they they think that romance is the most important thing in a relationship. But what, as you grow older, you realize that it's the curtains, you know. Uh, It's important, but it's not the most important thing. My wife likes curtains. It's important to her, right? But at the same time, and in the same breath, what's foundational to a relationship, what's foundational to a marriage, is not the curtains. It's the covenant that was made on the day in which you said, I do. It's not the ring on the finger. That's just a sign, okay? It's not the places that you take her to eat. Those are nice. Those flowers are nice. But that fades, does it not? Those flowers go away, those restaurants. What's important is your commitment, your faithfulness, whether or not you're true to your word. God has given us his word, friends, that if you put your faith and trust in his son, Jesus Christ, he will be faithful to you. And as believers, we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you've never done that, then I want to give you the opportunity to say, I'm a sinner, I've fallen short, and I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord. And friends, if you're a believer that's here today, I want to just tell you, if you're caught in sexual sin, if you're caught in 
immorality. This is an opportunity for you to say, you know what, I, I don't want to live that lifestyle. I want to be faithful and true. Father God, we give you thanks for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together in this place. I want to just ask that you would speak to us now, that you would give us courage and strength to respond. And Father, I pray that, that you'd be honored and glorified by the decisions that we make here today, that you would speak to us and that we would respond in such a way that would bring you honor and glory. And Father, if there's someone here today that has never accepted Jesus, I pray that today would be that day. I pray for the believer that may be struggling, that may be going through hardships, or maybe they're just uh, tired and weary and they just need encouragement today. Father, I pray that you would allow for this to be an opportunity for them to be given and imparted your grace and mercy. Lord Jesus, we love you and pray all these things in your name and all God's people said. Hey, we're going to sing a song of invitation. I'm going to invite you now to respond. Uh, you can stand with us and sing. And uh, this altar is here for you. You can come forward and you can, you can pray here. I'm going to be back in the Welcome Center. And I would love to be able to pray for you as well. If, uh, if the Lord is leading you, would you respond at this time? Stand with us and sing and respond as the Lord leads. <laughs>